everyone. Um, hopefully you can now see us on the Open Channel from Gas Safe Register uh, Facebook Live page. Um, my name is Scott Darrick. I'm Head of Communications for Gas Safe Register. And tonight we're hosting the third of our Open Channel sessions. Um, and this one is on uh, LPG. Um, for this session, we are joined by uh, friends and colleagues from uh, trade association Liquid Gas, formerly UK LPG, and I'm also joined by uh, my colleague Carl Bannister, who's a technical manager at Gas Safe Register. So we'll go through a conversation. As if any of you have joined um, us for any of these sessions before, you'll know how how they they work. Um, we'll talk through some topics. We'll share some discussion areas. If there are any areas where um, we feel that there's there's follow up or we start to see lots of questions coming in that we can't cover in, in full length on here. Um, we'll follow those up in Registered Gas Engineer magazine itself. Um, we will try and keep an eye on the questions that are coming in on Facebook itself. But for the most part, um, we've had some questions and topic areas that have come in from uh, from those involved. So we can steer the discussion towards um, towards some of those. So. I think I'll start by doing, doing some introductions. Um, we're joined tonight by Nolene McGuire, uh, Kaz Jamarski and Richard Hakim from uh, Liquid Gas, and as I say, Carl Bannister from uh, Gas Safe Register. Um, Nolene, can I just ask you to, to give us a bit of a, a, a brief introduction into um, LPG industry and, and what it means for us. We, we know that of the roughly 135,000 registered engineers on uh, on the gas safe register not not every engineer is qualified to work on lpg and even within those not every engineer who holds qualifications does work on there but it, it's a substantial audience group within it yeah sure thanks scott i'll just um if i can just give you a, a quick introduction into who we are at liquid gas uk so i'm noli mcguire i'm membership development manager for the association uh, fairly new to the industry, I was in automotive before, um, but I'm responsible for membership engagement and communication. So if you've ever seen any tweets, any posts on Facebook, Twitter or online, uh, that will be me. Um, now, many of you might know Liquid Gas UK. It's the trade association, as Scott said, and the voice of the LPG industry in the UK. Um, and we've been doing this for quite some time. In fact, about 45 years, so quite a while. Um, our members, just to give you a really brief uh, sort of flavour of who they are, um, they include LPG and bio-LPG producers, distributors, equipment manufacturers, service providers, and of course, also installers. Um, our members supply 99% of the total LPG, LPG distributed in the UK, so quite a good old covering. Um, as an association, we, we provide a wide range of support and services to, to our members, uh, but really our core business has always been about the promotion of the safe use of LPG um, and the production of technical safety guidance through our codes of practice, which I know some of you may already know about those through uh, access to standards through Gas Safe Register. Now these codes set the standard for the safe use of LPG in, in the industry in the UK, um, and I know Richard and Kaz, who are also on the panel, are going to talk to you about those a little bit later in the session. Um, but just to give a quick flavour on who we are, so as a team we work to raise the profile and the benefits of LPG uh, and the wider industry, keeping that conversation going. We take a, a really strong leading role liaising with um, many of the government departments, BAYS, DFT, legislators, policy makers with regards to influencing energy uh, policy within government. Um, and basically what I mean by that is we're making sure that LPG is always part of any energy conversation and discussion now, but also going forward as, as we look to net zero. Um, we work hard with our members, um, keeping them up to date with what's happening uh, in, in the UK, particularly at this current time, Brexit, technical and legal changes, with COVID, any announcements that's going to affect the industry and their business. Um, but we also host a range of events, um, enabling networking within our members uh, and a, a wider group of stakeholders, running lots of working groups, roundtable events, uh, webinars, and where possible, obviously, face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, for example, we, we hold a, an annual conference every year where we all get together. Um, and this gives our members the opportunity to share ideas and best practice and network with people that, uh, that perhaps they, they've not met before. 
I also understand there's a bit of business done in the bar afterwards, uh, but that's another story. Anyway, um, we also provide opportunities to our members to raise their own profile and their products and get that product out there. Uh, and we do that through our source magazine, uh, our industry blog that we, ho we host on our website, uh, monthly newsletters, um, and a whole host of other ways, uh, communication ways. So uh, anyway, finally for me, um, we're based in the Midlands in, in Kenilworth, for anyone that knows Warwickshire. Um, and we're a small team, there's just six of us. Um, and we have two of us on, on here today, so we've got Richard and myself. So yeah, that's just a really, really quick introduction to Liquid Gas UK. Now I know Richard, I'm going to hand over now, Richard's going to talk at some point uh, about the industry itself, LPG, the future of the industry, the size of the market and where that's heading. Um, so yeah, Scott, that's me. Lovely, thank you very much Nolene. Um, Richard, I think your, your area of interest is particularly around um, policy issues around here, but I think with any trade association, you know, we, you know, as, as the register, we, we know that we get a lot of feedback from engineers who who are really keen to hear their views uh, views represented and we're we're big fans of trade associations as a whole because we think they do a terrific job within within the sector and there are quite a few within there um, what, what's the feedback that you're getting particularly at the moment no one covered some of it but the, what the feedback you're getting from installers at the moment about work and working specifically in in lpg at the moment um, we work directly with our members um, it will be good to get much more feedback from the installers um, they're a very, very important part of our industry. Um, you know, they, they are the bridge between us and the consumers. Um, and they're the ones that will carry this, the messages that we need to deliver to consumers regarding safety. So um, I think the consumers, uh, sorry, the installers, um, there's two areas we work on particular, is to make sure that the um, ACS um, assessments are fit for purpose, really and the codes of practice that we produce um, is, is, contains enough detailed guidance in there for training centres to produce the right level of training for installers to sit their ACS and particularly new entrants coming into the industry. So that's the, they're the two main areas that we, we say influence um, we, we, um, where, the, where the installer um, is, is really connected. I think one one thing that we that we know for for engineers who work across lots of different aspects of gas work is sometimes it can be a frustrating part of the role that they're having to educate their consumers about what they're doing and giving them comfort that when they say this is something that needs to be done this is a bit of work it's to be done for safety reasons to do is comply with regulations and sometimes, um, you know, that can be a bit of an uphill struggle. Consumers can be a little bit reluctant. So as much as as part of your role is, is reaching out to installers who hold that, you're obviously, you're also, as an installers who work on LPG, are a bridge as well to consumers. So where, where does it fit in? What information is there available for, for engineers to get themselves up to speed, either through uh, some of the material that, that we have and the unsafe situation uh, documentation and other sort of general industry guidance but what is there as well that those working on lpg can can point consumers towards and say look i'm not making this up this is the guidance applies here this is what we need to know you know about here here's where you can get yourself up to speed and, and give a little bit of comfort yeah th thanks it's a very good question um nolene's been uh, revamping our website recently and what we've done is we've actually updated all our guidance um, that is com consumer related in the last couple of months and all that guidance is freely downloadable and it's available on our website we also work with um, that just just for the consumers but we also work with gas safe register with yourselves um, and we've signed up to access to standards to allow installers um, who are sole traders or having or have people up to five to be able to access um, not just our codes, but the iGEM standards and the British standards at a very, very reasonable price. Um, and, and in terms of, of 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 other bits as well, I mean, the, as a trade association, obviously you're you're mainly your trade your trade facing. Um, what can what can we do as an industry, and that's the register, it's yourselves and others, to sort of up up the profile of 
of, of LPG or sort of give people an idea of the the direction of travel in there. I know you know we've talked in, in preparation for this about um, the greening of the industry overall. You know, and you're seeing you know different uh, products and things coming in. It, are there conversations that we could be leading consumers with, or you know, looking for advice on on those kind of things as well? Yeah, well, what, as I said earlier, we've got very good guidance on our website um, regarding, you know, real key areas touching on regulators, the use of overpressure revalves, valves, how to use um, appliances safely, how to get them maintained, um, important numbers that they should, um, that they will need if they want to get their appliances serviced. And like I said, all these, all that information is freely available for the installers um, to download and at least point consumers to. Um, can I, thank, thank you, Richard. Um, at this point, can I, can I bring in um, my colleague, Carl Bannister? Carl, um, you're one of our technical managers. You take the calls that come in from members of the public and come in from engineers. What questions, what, what, are, what are you and the team yeah. most often asked about? You know, where, what's the, the hotspot topics around here that says, particularly around LPG, we see again and again, or we're seeing more and more recently? More and more recently, it's all about regulators and um, having OPSO devices fitted. Uh, that's a very common question and understanding of, of where they're needed and when. Um, we see a lot of questions about uh, hoses which are out of date and, and what should be done in them circumstances. Uh, but mainly we get a lot more questions from mobile catering and from caravans and holiday parks these seem to be very popular at the moment I think that may be down to COVID and uh, people staying at home and staycationing these days and in terms of, of the specific technical ones around here I mean um, we, we've seen a couple of incidents over the last few months where um, we've obviously without getting lost in the specifics of it where there's certainly been a suspicion that um, a poorly maintained or, or a regulator past its, its usable time has been a contributory factor to, to an incident. How well do we think it is, it, is it not known amongst consumers? I mean, pre presumably the conversation amongst engineers, they get that, you know, they know that, that parts have a, have a shelf life or have an operational life, or, or is there an education job to be done with, with engineers as well? Is this, is this a two phase, phase bit of work? Um, I think it is two phase, but it's all about education again, uh, educating the customer that you know these devices cannot last forever outside, or you know they need to be maintained and replaced uh, religiously or you know within the shelf life. Just because someone says it can last ten years doesn't mean it's going to. Especially you know I live in the North Wales coast and we get battered by the wind over and over again there was many times when i was on the caravan parks we'd see regulators that had all seized up because they were just full of the salt air so it's understanding the environment that they're placed in and you know that these again they need to be replaced and maintained and looked after and checked and safety checked is, is always paramount safety checking devices sometimes i think that's messed i think people believe they fit it and then and, and that's it then you mentioned as well some of the um the different ways that the LPG is used and we talk about the difference between holiday parks, mobile homes and others and, and often um, there's, there's maintenance regimes in place to see those things because if you're on a holiday park you know there are normally rules and regulations about things being on there so is, is that something that an engineer who may occasionally do LPG work will be, be called out to see? Do we tend to see those who operate in those areas specialising? We know that LPG use on boats is that there are particular sets of circumstances and regulations and what's in scope and what's not in scope um, around boats. You know, is, is LPG, if, if you're an LPG engineer, are you, are you all types? Do we see real specialization within there? Again, is, is there more that we need to be digging in to, um, you know, to, to say, you know, recognize that not yeah. all all gas engineers are created equal not all lpg engineers will be equal as well there will be people who specialize absolutely in specific areas and then that's understanding the subject you're working on isn't it so you know doing your acs is your minimum qualification then it's all about training and understanding where you're going and what you what you're coming up against 
you, we've all, you know, when the first time you pass your driving test and you're getting that car for the first time, you, you've got to still carry on learning as you're going. Uh, in the industry, you see people who do boats usually stick, stick where it's in it. The bit more, you know, they carry on with that subject and they become specialised in it. It's it's probably the same for caravan parks. I don't think it was a few years ago, but now it seems to be once you get on the caravan park, you you seem to stay on there, and you, that's the kind of work you get into. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions coming through, and, and I, I know someone's asking um, or, or sort of raising concerns about how robust are um, are some of the, the standards around here around the ACS and other questions around you. We'll pick those up because I know Richard, you know, you want to just have a, a chat on those a little bit. Um, Kaz, can I bring you in as, in as well? Just talk on, on the technical side. You know, Carl saying we, we see some questions around here. Um, Carl, you mentioned, you know, in, in our prep discussion around here, talk about copper olives and other, other specific bits that we see. What, what are the technical challenges that those sitting outside might not be aware of? Or, or again, the technical the technical hotspots on there that says, okay, you know, we now see products that are more robust than they might have been, that maybe are actually, you know, we're maybe seeing cheaper imports or things built to a price. What, what are the sort of technical stretches that we're seeing in some of those areas? Well, certainly, um, you know, um, I say I, I manage and um, I'm a business development manager and um, uh, the managing director of Kless Industries. So we, we, we manufacture equipment, um, in our factory in France, and uh, we bring that and we distribute that um, within the UK and Ireland. Um, we get a lot of um, interaction with installers who come to us, uh, who ask for uh, advice on what pieces of equipment to use in what particular sector of the market. So we do actually uh, have um, um, a lot of interaction with the installer community. Um, I think I just want to touch on one point that we mentioned earlier that I was trying to get in on, and that is. Um, I mean, one of the biggest challenges uh, for us in our industry is to uh, educate consumers that, uh, you know, this uh, LPG isn't a, a DIY fuel, you know. Yes, you know, they, they might use it for outdoor leisure pursuits, etc. But when they're actually connecting you know, LPG to their own domestic property, you know, what we want to make sure is it's, it's you know, that this is, this is a job for an installer. You know, well, in, got, okay, that, that's an interesting one. We had one question in... Um, in on there from Steve, who, who just recognises exactly that as a challenge. Um, and I think that's where the, the register and, and trade associations can work. How do you, you get that? How can we collectively work better to get that message across to consumers that says, this is not something that you nip down, down the hardware shop and buy yourself. This isn't something that you order on eBay. This should be part of a safety regime that involves a qualified professional who holds that, that particular set of competencies to do that. Where are we missing a trick as an industry? Are we pushed too far on the sort of convenience and accessibility bit around here without pushing as hard as, you know, certainly the, the register's message is always, you know, don't DIY with gas. But that is really on mains gas because that is our major area of focus. Do you think we've missed a trick slightly by not emphasising that just as hard on, on bottled gas? I think so, yeah. I think, I think you're right and you've got a point there. And... Um... I think we've all got to try harder to make sure that that message gets across. You know, again, you know, if you've got a, a barbecue connection, yes, it's very convenient. You know, everything's geared up, perfect fuel for that. But but once, but if you're connecting a hob, for instance, into a domestic property, then again, it's got to be treated like any other gas. You know, uh, any uh, like natural gas, um, and and therefore. You know, you've, you, you, you then have to refer to standards like BS6891, for instance, which gives you clear advice on what you need to do. You can't use a leisure regulator that you use on a barbecue, for instance, um, to connect to domestic appliances inside the property. You know, and this has been a push by um, the association, uh, by manufacturers, where you now have to have an OPSO system built into a, uh, um, a regulator that's being supplied by bottle and even even bulk tank installation you know so 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 in one respect the person with the bottles is now you know the the, the safety standards and, and the equipment required um that's supplied by a bottle is much the same as what is supplied by a bulk tank um um you know why should there be any difference in the in, in the way that the gas is supplied um there isn't uh, because the risks are all the same 
Um, so we've really got to get that uh, message across, particularly with bottles, that the same standards apply as, as if you had a bulk tank supply. So therefore you should have oxygen protection, you should have uh, the correct level of equipment uh, and not use uh, leisure, leisure regulators or something that you can buy um, from, off eBay, for instance. So, um, you know, we do our bit as a manufacturer. We produce the equipment to meet that um, requirement. Um, but I think it is something that um, the association and, um, uh, and Gas Safe need to push uh, a little bit further. Um, and I think Richard could probably say what the association is doing. I mean, we've had a big focus on that um, with the HSC uh, in the last couple of months. Um, because I think it followed an incident uh, where aging equipment was, um, uh, the finger of blame was pointed to aging equipment. And um, I think we really uh, analysed that subject and we, we really started to address the communications that are available, particularly targeted at the consumer, which will make the life of uh, installers that much easier to convince people that actually they should be treating it uh, with the correct level of respect. Richard? Is there anything? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll try and answer the other person's question as well and wrap it into this because it's all the same in terms of robustness of standards. So this is an example for many years now, we, we were working with the HSE to get OPSOs put into L56 for, cylind for single cylinders. And, you know, it's taken a long, a lot of time to get that into 6891, which got published, I think, last year. Or a couple of years ago and then you know we've got our codes now aligned with it but it's taken a good few years um you know to get this message um to, to the installers and i think that's a massive area of improvement that we can possibly work much closer as a trade association with with the um register you know and putting in articles into registered gas engineers is a good thing but i think you know we've got to recognize that installers are really really busy and sometimes they don't read it and we would be very open to having um, events for installers, joint events with the registration, with the registrar, um, you know, to, to, to give updates to installers on the guidance that's just been published, the messages we want to get through. For example, we've revised a lot of codes of practice um, recently and the guidance, you know, um, on, on all the subjects you've touched on just now, Carl. Um, but our frustration is how, how do we get this to the installer? And how do we get appropriate guidance to the consumer? Because we are a membership organisation. We are not a consumer body. So we're set up very different. So we, 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 have very, we have very clear demarcation lines. And it's difficult to get out of that because we don't have that network. And that's, why, and that's what the registration body, Gasseg Register, can bring to the party to actually deliver that message through. And the HSC are very, very happy to support it. So in terms of um, guidance and codes, um you know we were one of the main things we also do as a trade association is to and i know this was a bug there with installers is getting consistency across all the standards and that's one of the major things we've been doing in the last few years with igem um our codes and british standards to get that consistency across so there's no um and also not just that also clarity as well so it's not open to interpretation so we've put a lot of guidance a lot of detail into our, into our codes we've talked to installers and one of the case studies we did is we, we launched um, a new code a couple of years ago, which we call, in short, the catering code. <clears throat> and we, we worked with installers on that to make sure it was fit for purpose. Yeah. Can I, can I just come in there, uh, Richard, and just to say that there's, uh, one, one, one thing that's important is to have consistency with, um, with uh, natural gas and, um, and, and, and installation codes um, with natural gas. So, for instance, the... Um, the installation uh, British Standard 6891 um, covered, uh, now covers um, LPG in domestic premises. It covers uh, LPG in residential premises, but one of the things it didn't cover is actually LPG used in uh, mobile, um, mobile homes, holiday homes, uh, holiday home classification. So we're, we're just about to uh, publish a, um, um, a new code that will actually align um, the installation practice in mobile holiday homes to uh, the same same level of standard and the same level of equipment, more or less, to be used in in, in domestic um, in the domestic home environment under six eight nine one. Um, and I think that will make life a lot lot easier. You know, I can remember when I was an assessor and a, and a trainer. You know, 
I say it's very difficult to try and teach the differences between, um, uh, for instance, um, LAVs, RPHs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what we want to do uh, and what we're trying to do is try to align everything to make it as simple as possible and as straightforward as possible for the installer and also have the equipment available to be able to do that. There's just there's just some just some of the comments coming through. I mean, it's um, a question from from Dave as well, saying there's also the issue that many applications of LPG are not covered by any ACS, you know, mm -hmm. at the moment. So, is there a sense that as an industry or as all sides of the industry, um, we're we're starting to fill some of those gaps, you know, around here? You know, you know, Carl, we, you know, when we're getting approaches around here, are we as we've identified issues, you know, are we seeing the same issues? coming back again and again, or things being fixed. It sounds like from what Richard and Kaz are saying, from what Nolan said at the beginning, that there is a tightening up and there's a recognition of, of where known problems are. Um, I think the frustrating things for people is when it's the same problems keep coming back. If it's a new problem because it's a new set of circumstances, that's different. Is, is there a sense that we are getting a bit smarter in terms of, of just covering that ground and filling in some of those little gaps? Yeah, a bit. Yeah, we, you know, as an industry, we're always stuck behind the, 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 you know, the revolution of what's out there, and that, that that is, I think, Dave might be speaking about there would be things like Yates and you know, some along them lines where there is no standard that we can pick and choose. We can use, but we have to pick and choose what's best for the situation. So it, you know, as that, we're always playing catch up because. You know, everything outside moves moves a lot quicker than we we can we can as an industry with standards. So, yeah, yes, it's getting better. There's still a lot of ground to do. There is a big gap, I think, in the situation such such as Yates and uh, Shepherd Huts. Maybe they they're just a little bit out of the way as well. So maybe there could be a bit of a catch up there. And that might be somewhere along you know an article in association with, with UK LPG. Or within a wider industry audience. Yeah. And I think if we were looking just to sum up, we we started just a little bit late, so I'm happy for us to run a, a you know a minute or two you know over. It sounds like there's a couple of areas where there's sort of general acknowledgement that there's there's more that can be done, and I think you know the register and the whole of the industry we've got a the next challenge is, is to take that info phase you know it's a two phase piece. Are we getting the right information out? to installers who are working with, with LPG? And then are we giving them the right information to pass on to consumers? So I think there's some areas where we can all look to work together through there. And obviously we have, you know, we have some channels of communication. There are, you know, industry campaigning events. It's always, it's always good to see um, organizations getting involved with things like Gas Safety Week, which has always had an LPG element to it, but, you know, we can make sure that that's, uh, you know, that's really emphasized we've got things like CEO awareness week coming up as well so you know it's getting some of those things around here making sure that LPG is part of that has a voice um but it also sounds like you know we're, we're we have some challenges around um positioning it appropriately as something that's of suitable heft that you know when you say to consumers this isn't you know this isn't plug and play for something yourself this is still something you need a, a registered professional in, in to do something around here. So I think there's there's a little bit of work about upping the credibility or the visible credibility of engineers who work on it. And then I think there are, I think we'd all acknowledge there are still some challenges in terms of not only things like the, the codes of practice, although, you know, Richard, I know you're, you're, you're keen to emphasize, you know, there's documentation been coming through, but making sure that we're filling some of those gaps in in training and assessment as well. So, you know, where there's, there's gaps within ACS, making sure that they're kept up to date. Um, were there any other key points that anyone was really keen to get across? And otherwise I can summarise and, and wind yeah, up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Scott, while, while we've got the installers there, is really what's, what support would they like from us as a trade association? What can we do more for them to help their cause? And I picked up the bit on training and we work very closely with the ACS guys once our codes get published. But if there's anything they can think of, you know, channel it through to Gas Safe Register, you could filter it to us or we, they can contact us, contact us directly. Super, thank you. Were there any other key points from, from anyone else through there? Um, the only last thing from my point of view, um, Scott, I just wanted to say, you know, LPG is not really a need, we call it a niche industry. It's a thousand applications that are used on, you know, where LPG is used around the world. 
Um, in this country, we've just recently learned that we're a £1 billion industry. Um, we do have a future. Um, the government is now taking us seriously um, with the introduction of bio LPG, which can reduce carbon emissions by up to 90%. So we definitely have a strong future in the energy mix. Fantastic. Um, we'll do with, with this topic as we, we do with all things. Um, there's always more detail um, we can put onto things. There's always signposting towards assets and resources that already exist that people might not have realised were there. We always do a follow up on this in, in Registered Gas Engineer magazine, so we'll be really happy um, to carry a lot of that information. For those who are watching live, uh, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching on Catch Up, still do drop us a line drop a, a, you know, questions through. Um, if there are any burning issues, no pun intended, um, you know, we can, you know, we, we can feed them through to everyone who's involved and use that as some follow-up material and see if we can give this issue just a, another little poke and a prod as we go along. But for the moment, um, I'd like to thank everyone from UK LPG, as was Liquid Gas, as is now, for joining us. Carl, thank you for answering some of the technical questions. And with that, we'll say thank you very much and good night. Yeah, thank Please. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.